Hey class, I'm Mr Thornton and I'm going to help you succeed in your GCSE. This lesson, brain function and brain scans. This topic was suggested by Ahmed Baig, who just this week left me a comment saying, can you please do a video on brain imaging? I have already got a video filmed for this week, which was going to be all about household electricity and how we keep ourselves safe. However, this is a new topic. It's brand new to the new GCSE specifications and I just couldn't resist the temptation to go through it because it's a really interesting topic. So thank you Ahmed for the suggestion and anyone who's doing the legacy specifications, you don't need to worry about this, nor do people doing combined science. This is for separate sciences only. However, you might want to stick around and watch it anyway. I personally think it's quite interesting and hopefully you will too. The first thing all separate science students need to know, regardless of whether you're doing foundation tier or higher tier, is the basics of the brain structure and what its functions are. And there are just three key parts which you need to know about. The medulla oblongata, the cerebellum, and the cerebral hemispheres. Let's start with the medulla oblongata. It's located down here at the base of the brain. It connects the brain to the spinal cord and Basically, as a very simple rule of thumb, you can think of the higher functions of the brain are physically located higher up in the brain, and the more base functions of the brain are located lower down in the brain. And so it is with the medulla oblongata. It's responsible for an awful lot of what we call autonomic responses. Those are involuntary responses. And so it controls things like breathing, heart rate, blood pressure. If you sneeze, it's your medulla oblongata which has caused you to sneeze, the same with coughing, and the same with vomiting. So next time you're ill and you throw up, it was probably your medulla oblongata which prompted you to do that. Next is the cerebellum, and that's located around the back of the brain here. And this is where things start to get a little bit vague, because we're not 100% sure what all the different parts of our brain do. We can tell that the cerebellum is responsible for things like motor control because if people have a damaged cerebellum as a result of an accident or injury or a disease which has caused damage to it, then they tend to have poorer motor control, particularly with fine motor skills. They find it really difficult to do things like tracing a line or putting a key into a keyhole because they lack those fine motor skills which the rest of us might take for granted. It's possibly also related to some other things like acquiring language. It's a bit difficult to know for sure. But motor control is definitely one of its most important functions. Finally, up at the top, and we are actually skipping some of the key parts of the brain here, but they're not on the specification, so I'm not going to go into them now. But up on the top, we've got the cerebral hemispheres. These are responsible largely for gathering perceptual information from all your different sensory systems in your body and then making those higher order interpretations of those and for things like logic and reasoning. We still don't really understand them all that well. We've got a reasonable idea about roughly which parts of the cerebral hemispheres do which things but it's a bit like being able to point at a map and say that's Europe, that's America. You are not going into an awful lot of detail about the individual parts of those. You're just broadly saying this is this general area. We do know that the perceptual information from the right hand side of your body is controlled by the left hemisphere and the left hand side of the body's perceptual information is going to the right hemisphere that whole thing about being left-brained or right-brained though, that's a load of nonsense. Those sorts of higher level functions like logic and reasoning are distributed throughout the brain. There are some specific functions which may happen in a very specific area in the brain, but mostly those complex thought processes which make us who we are, those are happening throughout the entire brain. Also, it's worth mentioning at this point, that thing which Hollywood loves trotting out in different films, saying we only use 10% of our brain. Well, in any instant, we might only use 10% of our brain because there's a bit of our brain which deals with language and there's a bit of our brain which deals with motor control and so on. All those different skills have different parts of the brain. So to use any one of them, we might just be using that bit of the brain. But 
overall, over the course of a normal day, and certainly over the course of a normal week, we'll use the whole lot. That's all that foundation tier students need to know about the brain, but higher tier students need to be able to discuss how it is we understand which bits of the brain do different things. And unfortunately, that's a tricky thing for us to work out because evolution has done a very good job of protecting our brain because, of course, even small amounts of damage to our brain can have very big effects on all sorts of things about how we control our bodies, how we process information, and even our personalities. So our brains are encased in a nice hard skull and getting in there is not easy. It's not easy particularly on a living person. Cutting open cadavers can give us some idea of the structure of the brain, but it doesn't really tell us much about what's going on in a living person and how exactly they're using their brain. It also doesn't allow us to see inside the brains of a living person if, for example, they've got something like a tumour in their brain. And so brain scanning techniques allow us to look inside someone's skull where otherwise the only ways that we'd be able to do it would be to cut a hole in their head and potentially cause serious damage to their brain. AQA and WJC Educast want you to know about two key ways that we can look at what's going on in our brains. The first is MRI scanning, that's magnetic resonance imaging. And this basically uses a very big magnet. An MRI scanner looks something like this, where you've got a bench which people can lie on and that goes inside this large cylinder. Inside that cylinder is a very big magnet, a very big, very strong, very powerful superconducting magnet. And what that does, when you expose different atoms to magnetic fields, it can cause them to oscillate and vibrate and emit radio frequencies. In this case, it usually relies on hydrogen atoms. Our bodies contain a lot of water and also a lot of fat, and both of these are good sources of hydrogen atoms, and so it's normally the hydrogen atoms which an MRI scanner relies on. So, without going into more detail than you really need to worry about, what it does is it exposes your body to a very large magnetic field that changes direction and as it does that, the atoms of hydrogen in your body vibrate. They oscillate and they emit radio frequency radiation which we can then detect. And this does this in slices. It moves to different points and takes basically a snapshot through your body, detecting the radio frequencies which are emitted, and a computer can then stitch all those slices together to give us a 3D model. Now there's a big advantage to this, and that advantage is that this does not produce any ionizing radiation. Although it sounds a little bit terrifying to be stuck inside a really big magnet, actually We've been doing these since the 1970s and there is no sign that they cause any harm to the patient whatsoever unless that patient has any sort of metallic and particularly magnetic implants. Anything made of steel or iron is going to be responding very strongly to that intense magnetic field. It could be damaged and it could injure the patient as well because it's going to move around in that magnetic field, something we really don't want. So people with, for example, pacemakers may be limited or may not even be able to use an MRI scanner like this simply because the strong magnetic field would be interacting with their pacemaker. For people who don't have any implants and don't have any metal in their bodies and have made sure that they've removed things like piercings, for other people, it's absolutely fine. But it's crucial that people with any sort of metal don't go anywhere near one of these when it's switched on. The second method isn't so much brain scanning or brain imaging as it is directly interacting with the brain, and that is electrical stimulation. This is pretty much what it sounds like. This is where electrodes are inserted, very, very tiny electrodes that is, are inserted into the brain. And this can be normally done with minimal or even next to no damage whatsoever to the brain. They are very, very thin pieces of wire which are inserted into the brain. Now yes, the skull does have to be drilled open to do this, but it is possible to do that without causing damage to the brain if it's a skilled surgeon doing the work. 
The electrodes are inserted and they can detect the electrical signals moving around in the brain and give doctors an idea of whether or not those electrical signals are moving where they should be. They can also be used to send electrical signals into the brain and used to directly stimulate different parts of the brain. Now this can be useful for treating all sorts of different conditions, but particularly things like Alzheimer's and epilepsy, or at least certain types of epilepsy, there are signs that this could be a very effective technique. So although it may seem a little bit gruesome, it can actually be a potentially life-saving or at the very least life-improving technique for an awful lot of people. At Excel students, you don't need to know about either of those two techniques, but you do need to know about two other techniques. The first is CT scanning, that's short for computed tomography. All that means is a computer is being used to build up a picture of what's going on inside the body. Much in the same way as with an MRI scan, actually. A CT scanner looks pretty similar to an MRI scanner as well, but this doesn't use a big magnet. What this uses is a source of X-rays. The X-ray source moves round and round the patient. It follows a full circle around there and opposite that X-ray source is an X-ray detector. So these move round the patient inside that cylinder and as they do that, it's taking scans straight through the patient's body. A computer then turns these into individual slices, again, like the MRI scanner, and then a computer can also turn that into a 3D image. This has the advantage of being completely safe for people with things like implants, but the disadvantage of exposing the patient to ionizing radiation. X-rays can cause damage. They can increase the risk of things like cancer, potentially. And so there is a slightly different danger there. Now, the amounts of X-rays used are relatively low, and depending on the situation of the patient, it may be absolutely fine to use a CT scan. In some cases, the MRI scan can be quite noisy and intimidating, whereas the CT scan can be a lot less stressful for patients as well. So there are various reasons why it might be preferable. The final brain imaging technique I want to talk about is PET scanning, or PET scanning. This is nothing to do with scanning a cat or a dog. The PET is short for positron emission tomography. And it's my personal favourite of all the brain imaging techniques. I think it's really cool the way it works. What happens is we dose a patient with a radioactive form of glucose. That is a normal glucose molecule, but one of the atoms in there is actually a radioactive isotope, which is going to decay and give out radiation. The decay involved is very, very similar to beta decay. Remember in beta decay, which if you need to recap on the different types of nuclear decay, you can do in this video here. In beta decay, a neutron decays into a proton and an electron, and that electron is fired out of the nucleus as a beta particle. In positron decay, which is going on with our radioactive form of glucose, it is a type of beta decay, but actually it's a positron which is produced. A positron is the antimatter counterpart of an electron. It's got exactly the same mass as an electron, but it's got equal and opposite charge. It works basically the same as an electron, but it's made of antimatter rather than matter. Now you don't need to worry too much about what antimatter is, except for this one key fact, when antimatter bumps into a counterpart particle of matter, the two of them annihilate each other. They turn completely into energy according to Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. That's the energy released is equal to the mass times the square of the speed of light. Now, although we're just talking about two particles which each have the mass of an electron, which is an incredibly tiny mass, as I'm sure you know, even so, if you are multiplying that by the square of the speed of light, you can still get a fairly significant answer out of this. So when the positron collides with an electron in this process, it releases a lot of energy. And that is the crucial thing which allows this process to work. The way that the positron decay works is very similar to normal beta decay, but in this case, it's a proton which decays, and it decays into a neutron and a positron. So the charge has been conserved. We've gone from a plus one charge to a neutron with no charge and a positron, which still has that plus one charge. 
Again, really similar to beta decay, and the positron is fired out of the nucleus of the atom which has decayed. The reason that we use glucose with an atom in it which will exhibit this sort of decay is because glucose is used in respiration. So the patient is given this dose of radioactive glucose, usually it will be injected directly into their veins, and their body doesn't really see a difference between this glucose and any other glucose. So the parts of their body which are doing the most respiration draw the most of this glucose in. And so it's those parts of the body which are going to be emitting the most positrons. Within the brain, it's the section of the brain which is engaged with a task which is going to be the part of the brain absorbing the most glucose and therefore producing the most positrons. Typically the patient is given some sort of task. Recall a fond childhood memory or interpret a piece of artwork or do some mental arithmetic. And different parts of the brain will be involved in these specific tasks and they'll be producing the most positrons which we can then start to investigate. We can't see the positrons directly though. What we see is what happens when they collide with a nearby electron. They really don't get very far before they bump into an electron. And when they do, as I said, the positron meets the electron, they collide and they annihilate each other and they produce a pair of gamma rays. Now those gamma rays are traveling outwards in opposite directions and they can be detected by our PET scanner. Gamma rays are really useful things to use because they'll travel through the patient's body really easily. They're not really stopped by the patient's skull. And so we can detect them outside of the patient's skull. A PET scanner will look pretty similar to the different types of scanner we've already looked at. And it does a very similar job. The only difference is arranged around the patient in this case will be a set of gamma ray detectors. And from those emitted gamma rays, we can start again to piece together an image of which bit of the brain is active. Again, it's going to take a computer to be able to make sense of all this data, but we have powerful enough computers now to be able to do that. Quite often a PET scanner is also combined with a CT scanner. So you'll be able to combine those X-ray slices through the brain along with the information about exactly which part of the brain is active. So you'll get a 3D structure of the brain and you'll be able to see exactly which bits of the brain are involved in a particular task. I hope that video really helped you. To see what else I can help you with, there's lots more videos to check out on my channel. Scroll down the main page there to see I've already sorted them into playlists to help you find the video you need. You can also check out my revision guides which cover everything you need to know for the exam. They feature links to my videos, revision tips, cover both foundation and higher tier, and unlike a lot of revision guides, they also point out what you don't need to waste time. If you want to check your learning, try the Snap Quiz website and app, which allow you to identify which areas you need to spend the most time learning. Remember, this is the only YouTube channel which brings you the teachers, the textbooks and the tests all on your terms, on mobile phone, tablet or computer for you to revise when you want and how you want, even immediately before you go into the exam. All of these links and any others for this video will be down in the description. Lastly, it really does help my channel if you want to leave likes, if you subscribe, or if you know someone else who's having trouble, tell them to search for Mr. Thornton. Good luck in your GCSEs everyone, and thanks very much for watching.